learning programs that we offer. Okay. Um, for all of us, uh, for all of you who don't know, uh, we um, have been around for a while, uh, since I think like 2002 or 2003. And um, we are here to support you all in developing a food sovereign city where we are the producers of the majority of the fruit and vegetables that we consume. And um, we are here to help uh, you all so, uh, support this mission as well in your backyards or in your community spaces, market spaces, schools, and facilities. Um, so um, please reach out to us if you have any support. Um, we believe that, you know, there should be several places around the city where fresh food and veggies are offered or in the neighborhood um, and gardens and farms should, you know, be appropriately scaled to the neighborhood and so we can maximize the surrounding community and help the economic development that goes around that, uh, supporting that community through agriculture and uh, benefiting the residents as well. Um, so we do that through our, mainly through our uh, garden resource program, um, which uh, many of you are a part of. The program consists of a couple different memberships. We got a family garden that's for like basic backyard growers um, and folks that are kind of like smaller scale. And then um, we got a community school garden and market package for um, bigger scale gardens and folks that have more growing space and more growing capacity um, and are willing to, uh, you know, receive more resources and, and need more resources for their growing spaces throughout the city. Um, program has been around since 03, um, doing well. We currently have um, around uh, 1300 folks registered, a little bit over when I checked earlier in the program. Um, Naja, if you could drop the um, link in the chat for the application for the program, just in case folks need it or, um, you know, haven't signed up yet this year and need to. Um, and um, we support those memberships through a ton of resources through our garden resource program. This is some of them here. Um, and all of these resources can be found on the um, guide to the KGD resources. If you're a new member to the GRP, you should already have seen this in your welcome email. Um, the welcome email has a ton of information, so make sure that you read it entirely. It has links to this guide and other guides that um, have tons of resources for you to take advantage of. So um, we, we support growers through design support. This is where if you have a space and a budget and haven't, you know, haven't gotten a feel for what type of uh, infrastructure or plants or flower beds or what you were quite, you know, what you want to quite do with the space yet, we can help you design a space that fits your um, capacity and your needs around growing, whether you want to grow for uh, more, um, larger scale or a smaller, aesthetically pleasing community space, we can help you either way. So um, we offer soil testing. Each membership comes with a soil test free for each member. Um, and you also have the opportunity to uh, take a sample and drop it off to me at the office and um, I process them and kind of give you a little uh, backdrop on where your soil health is, like the pH and how much organic matter and how much uh, phosphorus and potassium is in your soil, how much calcium is in there and uh, other little elements that you may want to know. So um, you get a free soil test every year with the membership. So make sure you take advantage of that. Um, you get seeds and plants. We got uh, three distributions that we do throughout the year. Um, spring, summer, fall type of situation. Um, and they usually occur April, May, and July. And um, for community, school, and 
um, growers and market growers. We support um, through uh, raised bed lumber. We don't build the beds, but we do give you lumber towards uh, to to uh, generate the beds. But we don't like physically build them for you at all. But um, we do support with the lumber, and it's it's expensive. Um, tilling haven't been doing so much of, but we do have a, a, a race, a reference guide, if you will, folks who do tilling. Um, we offer compost, wood chips, and tomato steaks at our local resource hubs. Um, they're regionally throughout the city, east, west, and central. Um, this guide, I went over it again this year and added um, a page for each hub individually because they all are different. Um, so take advantage of that and go visit the hubs. And then we also supply uh, real cover and trellis netting to growers um, throughout the season as it's available um, at our distribution. So ton of resources for the program. Um, make sure you join if you aren't and um, enjoy. All right, so- um, Can you move on, Armando? There's a few yeah. things in the chat. What's up, what's up? To that slide. And I'm gonna take this one, Naja, just cause um, I don't know if we really brought you up to speed on this yet. So um, there's a question about becoming active. Okay. Can you just elaborate on how to become active? Yep, and so we, um, we qualify active as uh, coming out to uh, volunteer or support, you know, your local growing community um, whether that be uh, actually getting in the soil, whether that actually be, you know, putting them onto the program, whether it be, you know, going out to help them uh, with what you've learned from this class or beyond what we are offering, just that you are active in the community and that you are actively uh, engaged in the program is what we qualify as active. So you know where, you know, you know what you get with the with the program, you know, uh, how to get the resources, et cetera, et cetera. Are you gonna be elaborating on soil testing a little bit more later? Um, wanna, we can go, we can go ahead and knock it out. Let's knock it out. Uh, okay, Naja, you wanna take that one? The, the pre is it safe? Is it, okay, yes, hold on, let's so go back up to it. I was gonna answer. Is it safe to grow your garden directly in the soil in Detroit? Yeah. We had a garage demolished in their backyard. Okay. And they wanted to know. If they should did. get it tested. Hmm. Yes. They should get it tested. The garage, um, assuming it wasn't a, a four car garage, it should be within a 30 by 30 area. So when we uh, process our soil samples, we recommend that folks hmm. do them in a 30 by 30 area which is around 900 square feet, 30 feet in length, 30 feet in width. And we um, do that because it really zones out uh, if there are any contaminants where they are specifically in the ground or around, around your land. So assuming that the garage was a regular one or two car garage, you should be able to fit um, one sample in that space where the garage was, get the soil tested, see how it comes back. And then you'll know if you have, you know, a hot lead situation or if you're good to go. Just You might have to get some virus protection. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> oh, you mean, um, so, so, um, yeah, I think, I mean, if that answers the question, I mean, but for the most part, the test that we do in the city is pretty fair. It's pretty fair land to grow in. If that's a, um, if that's an issue. Uh, any more questions? Um, I'll I'll address the seed one in the chat. Um, okay. If you could just talk about the um, uh, additional resource. Um, yeah. Additional resource guy. Uh, well, the additional. Uh, they're requesting how to make a request for, for raised beds. Uh, you fill out the garden um, development. You can fill out the garden development. Your card. Okay, I, okay, we're good. I just muted. Um, somebody, so 
The uh, garden development support form is on the members only page. If you um, got a welcome email, the password for the members only page is in there. And you go on there and you fill out the support form and just uh, say that you, you know, wanted to request raised bids. There are some prerequisites that you uh, need to have to get the raised bed lumber resources. We do require that you have a soil test that um, that ideally has no lead or low lead in it, um, lower than the recommended uh, uh, standards of 400 uh, parts per million. And then um, that you, you know, have an active membership if you've gotten raised bed uh, resources before, we do prioritize folks who have not gotten any resources before. So I think we start distributing uh, um, to folks who have like mid-year, like July or so. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna help with that one. I'm, I'm dropping the, um, yeah, the application, the link for the application I'm dropping in the chat. And with yeah. that, we should probably keep rolling here. Yep, yep. Okay, so um, just wanted to touch bases on uh, this slide here, um, why gardening is important. Um, you know, we all have our different reasons on why we want to start a garden, but when you're starting a garden, you always want to consider how much capacity you have to grow, who will be involved, and what it is that you actually want to grow, and make sure that it's centered around those things. All right. Um, so here we're going to get into garden uh, site assessing a little bit. Um, now we do offer tons of support to growers around this as well, like um, like plot plans and whatnot. But that's more so like if you're trying to buy land or but some people just have land and need like plot plant support. So we do we do offer support for that. So. Uh, I don't know if you want to drop the link in the chat for that keto to the land page, but we do uh, have that on our website as well. And um, but we, the garden development team, support gardeners who are selecting a new site or planning to develop their growing spaces by um, one, like establishing who owns the site. So usually when I go on a site visit, if folks don't know, I can just go on whatever app or software and look it up and tell them if they're unfamiliar with that. Um, but aside from that, we also, you know, looking at the land slope, the soil quality, the sun exposure, where is the water coming from? And then we also want to, you know, get that soil test just to make sure that there are no contaminants or anything like that in the soil before folks get started. All right. Um, this slide to the to the right is just indicative of how much stuff folks can grow like before the season even gets started, just going crazy on the porch. Um, here, um, oh yeah, I got a lot of links already in here too for y'all. Um, this is the um, land support like I was talking about earlier. Um, you can visit our land access page on the website uh, they also will support you with determining the landowners, assistance with all of these city programs. We got a ton of them here in Detroit. Um, land application support if you're trying to buy or expand on your land. Um, they, like I said earlier, do plot plan support and a whole bunch of other stuff. So visit the website, check it out. Um, and this slide is just indicative of um, basic uh, how much the water, how, what is sunlight, like what is full sun, what is part sun. Um, so full sun is um, a space that receives six or more hours a day of sunlight directly. And part sun is a space that receives four to six direct hours of sunlight a day. Um, so if you got a plant and it say part sun or full sun, you know, four to six or six or more hours preferred. Uh, different forms of water access. We got the infrastructure page that on the website that links uh, with tons of um, tons of stuff like uh, field barrels and how to build one of these water catchment systems. You see, it's a material list and a um, 
whole like how to do in there. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, and I also wanted to touch on here just different forms of uh, water access that folks I see uh, doing site visits around the city. So aside from the, the water catchments that we do, I see tons of folks taking advantage of uh, the gutters and catching rainwater in these barrels for their garden and in these IBC totes, as you see um, in that third picture. And then, you know, we always got the uh, regular side water spigot from the city, which if you run in, um, you know, city water, it's, it's, uh, can be high. So, um, and then we uh, touched on how much the water and how often the water, you wanna water your garden when the soil is dry to the touch, like if it's real dusty, or if you see any signs of cracking or the uh, amount of water uh, that you'll have to use throughout the season will definitely change throughout the year. Um, just as like, you know, like right now, it's just been raining for what, like two or three days here in the city. So a lot of soil is saturated. So the water availability is high. You might not have to water for a day or two for a minute. So um, just got to watch the soil and, uh, you know, watch it and, and see when it's time to uh, give her a drink. And then, um, as I said earlier, the garden development support team, which I'm a part of, um, the first step in getting our support is joining the program and then kind of reaching out to us and letting us know what kind of support you need. Um, we got the soil testing I talked about. Um, we got a soil testing guide that if you want to take your test, um, we, we just show you, you know, how we um, zone it out with the 30 by 30. And then we um, recommend that you take a few samples in that space. But the guide is available. Um, the link is there um, if you want to drop that in the chat as well. And then we also got the garden consultation, which you can kind of like uh, if you need support through a specific situation or have a specific topic you need consulting on. We got that as well in the support form. You just let us know you need a consultation. And um, Sterling just started the virtual office hours this month as well. Um, and those will just be uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. And we'll, you'll have direct access to the GD team and ask us whatever you need help with throughout the season. Um, so here, I'm gonna just talk about, uh, oh, should, before we move on, got any questions directly? No? Uh, just, yeah, just a quick check-in. How is everybody doing? Um, so there's a few, so I'm, I'm just gonna say, and um, there's a few things in the chat here um, that we're gonna, we're just gonna try and stay, there's so much information here that Romano is covering. <laughs> So it's a lot, you all, but we're going to try and kind of keep it linear. We'll, we'll, um, we're going to hold uh, some of these questions till the end um, and we'll make sure that we'll follow up. I might start answering between Naja and myself. We'll, we might start answering some of them in the chat. Okay. Indeed. But it just, I, just to know everybody um, that we are going to be sharing the recording. So this is going to be being recorded. It'll be up on our YouTube channel. And we also will share the slides after the fact so you can access the information in the slides and the links and so forth um, uh, from, the, from the slides after the fact. So we'll follow up with an email uh, with that stuff in, a, in the next couple of days. All right. Um, all right, you all, um, we're gonna dive into different types of gardening infrastructures here. Um, our duck gardening styles. Um, we've got uh, these are these are just a few. Um, there's many. Um, these are just a few, but we got in ground here, um, which is the top right where you see God just got his his brown paper bags laid out. He about to put his moss down or his soil down over it, and he about to get the growing. He ready to rock, um, and. We got raised beds, you see the bottom right where we got the 
community right here getting it together. Look like they installing these raised beds, about to get ready to start some growing. Um, and then we got the potted garden to the center here, um, where they got look like they got some leafy greens and some, some herbs in there. And then we got the indoor garden, which we um, have links to indoor growing and potted gardens on the website and raised bed building and gardening. So check that out if you want more detail about those. Um, and, uh, oh, I just wanted to touch on something real quick, basic gardening, right? So if, if you're in a space like this and you want to put raised beds and you have a perimeter here. I've been studying up on accessibility, y'all. So to make this garden a little bit more accessible, what I would do is move the beds off of the fence, maybe to here, just to have enough room to have folks come around here, you know, and access the garden on this way. But I mean, maybe they don't have space, you know, things like that. But just in terms of accessibility, but um, I wanted to dive into the in-ground garden beds a little bit more thoroughly. So the in-ground pros, um, there are no limitations on like planning death or, or, you know, growing space in terms of like being restricted to a four by eight or whatever. So um, that's one of the pros of being in the ground. Um, you directly connected to the earth. So uh, you get all the, you know, direct connection benefits. I'm gonna just call it that. Um, and then you also generally use less material cost to begin with because you're using all of that topsoil. And if your soil results are good, you, you can just, you know, turn it over, flip it over or build it up and keep it moving. And then it makes it a lot easier on designing, especially because most of the time when people do in-ground, it's more production style. Um, very rarely do you see a few, it looked like somebody may have taken some raised beds, raised beds up in that picture and started gardening. But um, nonetheless, uh, they have cons as well. The in-ground beds, they're uh, heavily dependent on soil quality. Um, so if you got rough clay, rocky soil, then it's probably not, you know, gonna be a very productive season for your crops to be in an uncomfortable position and could be very difficult to, you know, just generate any growth at all, honestly. Um, so uh, it depends on, you know, the quality. Some soils really sandy, so that's a limitation. Uh, and then you have heavy exposure to wind and pests. Um, especially for, you know, the crops that are just starting out, you know, baby size or um, for your, you know, younger tender crops, they're exposed to the wind and the pests, you know, live in the ground. So they're directly exposed to those as well. A lot of them anyway. Um, but we'll need, uh, you'll definitely need to plan to maintain your weeds if you grow and growing in ground. You want to get a plan to mulch heavy or suppress your weeds in some type of fashion. Some people use the plastic. You see those at the top. Um, some people with mulch heavy. There's tons of different ways to suppress the weeds, but you definitely need a plan growing in, in ground. Um, we're going to go move on to the raised beds. Um, so the raised bed pros, uh, they come in many different shape sizes. They could be made from tons of different materials. They could be insulated, they can be customized, they could be all type of stuff. Um, and, you know, they got a ton of benefits for seniors and elderly folks gardening, minimizing your bending. Um, you know, some of them can be um, adjusted to run drip line through them. So that's a benefit. Uh, definitely promote safe, the safest garden practicing with the uh, with the um, height and reducing the bending and the um, just strain overall that you have on on your body when you um, gardening. 
and um, add, you know, they, they also conserve water pretty well, depending on um, how deep they are. Um, uh, they control like how much weeds you get in the garden because the higher you build the beds, like the less the weeds become a problem, so to speak. Um, and for the uh, cons, um, they can be expensive to build for sure. Um, and depending on, you know, how high you want to go, I think those beds in the, um, the center picture here are about uh, two and a half feet high, maybe almost three feet high. Um, I know our beds, these are our beds here at the KGD farm. I think they're about two feet high. And then uh, these beds down here, I think these are just 10 inch uh, single panel beds. And so even these may run you about, you know, lumber for these maybe like 90 bucks or so for each bed. Then you got to construct it, fill it. You're looking at easily, you know, 200 bucks or so for constructing that and filling it up. Um, and then, you know, you got to replace pieces over time, they rot. And then they also can be very limiting in terms of now we can only grow in this four by eight area in, in terms of production. Um, so we got container gardening. Container gardening is a, a is just what it sounds like growing in containers, um, tons of different pots. Shape, sizes, colors, materials, clay, ceramic, plastic, hard plastic, soft plastic. So kind of you got to work with what's best for you or what's available for you. Um, and pots can be elevated as well and made in various different types of um, 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 adjustments where either they're elevated or they're uh, in the ground or they're stacked on top of each other to like add more soil depth. I've seen tons of different ways that people grow in pots. It's just all about, you know, what you have access to. Um, but a couple of the pros are they're easily transported. Um, they can grow a multitude of things. Like we see we, somebody got beets in there. Somebody else looks like she plants some greens in her pots. So you can put a tons of different things in there. And then uh, they're very affordable. Pots will start off like three or four dollars. Um, minimal materials. If you're growing in pots, you're not gonna need as much material, soil, uh, or, or amendments or anything like that. Pretty low maintenance. Um, and then they also take up minimal space. So all of the garden maintenance is is um, not eliminated, but it's definitely minimized with the pots because um, they kind of sit up higher and it's just not much soil that you have to maintain so and but the cons are that you know usually when people grow in pots they only grow one thing per pot so you're gonna have you know 40 pots which may or may not be a problem if, or uh, and then you have to consistently water the pots because they drain <laughs> and they become dry and you know you got to constantly water the plants so they can drink um uh, so, and then they also are exposed to wind too, especially when they're dry and light, you get a strong wind, they can knock the, especially those light plastic pots, they just knock them right over or push them over. So that's kind of a con when you're growing as well. Before you go on. Yep. Uh, can we back up a few slides? Naja, if you could get the, uh, address a few of these questions in the chat. Okay, so we have, do you recommend growing strawberries in gutters? Mm. Um, mm. That's mm. different. Probably not. Nope. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, Lock your gutters up. Simply because the gutters carry materials that can be unwanted. Um, from the roof, debris, et cetera, et cetera, uh, rodents, whatever, you know, could be up on your roof. You don't want to. Hey, um, Ramondo, on, yes. on YouTube, they were taking um, 
gutters and attaching them to a fence and putting them in the mm. gutter there. Mm. And that's, okay. what, they, that's mm -hmm. what she's probably referencing. Okay, yeah, that probably wouldn't be an issue. But I just thought you meant like just <laughs> your gutters at the house. Like, no, don't do that. Hey, so but on a, wait, but a, they would be, a, a gutters would make a good, yeah, a foundation for the strawberries and they're deep enough depending on which type of gutter you get. But it's okay to get the water from the gutters, right? Like if you attach the bin to your house or something? You should filter it. You should definitely filter it uh, as, as much as you can. I know they sell the filters now for the gutter, actually, that just covers the gutter or sits in the gutter. I would get that. And I also would filter the actual gutter when it downspouts, like into the barrel. I would filter that with the finer filter. And then, you know, let the water run through all of those and come down. Okay. Or, I mean, can I just add an alternative for rainwater? The general recommendation is just as long as you're using it on the roots of the plants, you should be fine. You're just never using that as never washing with it. Um, and I mean, because filtering is going to be is a, is a production. And many people are using rainwater, you know, collected rainwater. So as long as you're just watering the roots with it and washing your produce really well after you've harvested it. Yeah, yeah. And then there there were a few more raised bed related questions in the chat, and then there's a hand up also. What's yeah. up? So uh, the hand up, I think, is for this question here in the chat from Olga Johnson. Uh, okay. What are your suggestions? Hey, Olga. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nazem. Oh, no. suggestions as far as painting red raised beds is the lumber you supply for raised beds pre-cut it is pre-cut uh for into four and eight foot pieces um in terms of painting it don't paint the side that will be in direct contact with the soil but you can paint the outer layer of the bed i don't think that'll is, be an issue is there a specific paint you recommend our raised beds they're kind of old some of them we're going to have to replace, but some of them we can paint, I believe. Is it a, mm. a particular type of paint we should use? Mm, not that I'm aware of, Keto. Uh, I don't know if you want to... Turn you don't have to that. tell me today. You know, maybe yeah. I could reach out to you. You could let me know later what's recommended. Yeah. I mean, we have used Thompson's Water Seal. Um, there's a newer... There's another, like, newer kind of um, more, like, water-based product that was supposed to be a little bit more environmentally friendly, but I don't remember the name of it. Um, uh, it go ahead. Just a water-based paint product. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Yep. Um, all right, was that the hand up, Naz? Uh, you know? One more raised bed yes, question before we go on. Okay, what's one up? Someone's asking about the kiddie pool. Is that okay to use as a raised bed? Mm, I probably wouldn't use that as a raised bed. Okay. Why not? Because they just like let a water, most of them let a lot of water sit in. I mean, you could try to drain it out. I mean, I guess it depends on which one. Right. Maybe if it was like a hard plastic one, okay. But like a soft, a really soft plastic one that would like probably get, uh, you know, degrade, start degrading in the garden. I wouldn't use. If that makes sense. I, mean, I think it, that applies. Just like I think what you're getting at, drainage holes is important, and that's with the same yeah. thing with the gutters, right? Exactly. If you're doing if you're going to make up, you know, do your strawberries on your fence. You got to make sure you have some drainage holes, and the same thing if you're fooling around with, um, you know, with a, a baby pool. Yeah. And then the galvanized beds, there was a question about galvanized. We, I think a lot of folks use that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any any thoughts on that? Um, no, just, a, you know, it can get expensive with the galvanized. Most of the galvanized beds that I've worked with um, usually have a lumber element and then a galvanized covering. Um, but, you know. Yeah, or or they're just all galvanizing like circular, uh, something like that, or oval shape. I've seen those ones. They have kits for those. Um, the square ones, the, those ones, um, 
like just for the governor, I just want to watch for the the thickness of the steel, the thin ones, they dent really easy. Like if you try to fill them up with a wheelbarrow, watch out for that, things like that. Um, but just all depends on, like I said, the quality of the steel, but they work in terms of productivity. Um, I hope that helps. Um, and then, so to, uh, I think we're good to move on now, yeah? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, all right, so we're going to start talking about plant functionality here a little bit. Um, and uh, anatomy, uh, you know, where's the leaves, just basic stuff, where's the roots, we all should know. Um, and what, what all of these things do. So light uh plants use their leaves to photosynthesize the sunlight and make energy for their root system to uh to do osmosis and store water into the fruit of their plant and into, into the fruit of their yeah into their fruit rather and so um that's what that's what photosynthesis is for, for making fruit and making energy for the roots to move the water around and also to um, uh, the plant immunity, the immune system. Um, plants do have an immune system and a life cycle. So keep that in mind. Um, and then water, uh, like I moved on, like I touched on earlier, is just for moving around and, um, and uh, storing. And then you got to provide some type of drainage for your plants for uh, airflow and so they can breathe enough to uh, absorb the water, so to speak. And it's not just suffocating them or drowning them or, you know, they can't get any airflow to uh, intake the water. And then this um, last note about the nutrients and minerals amendments, um, this can be a variety of things depending on your need, um, what specifically are you trying to treat, where you shop. Um, but you know, no matter where you shop or what you're trying to um, address, we always suggest that you use organic materials to nourish your plants and the amount of uh, nutrients that each plant needs will vary from plant to plant. Um, some plants are heavy feeders and they require more food, more nutrients. And some, you know, are very sensitive and don't require much or very little or, you know, just kind of finicky and I want what I want when I want it type of deal. Oh, and but always apply compost. Don't, I don't want to miss that last note. Compost is great um, to apply slow release. It's not a big shock to the plants and it's always good to... Um, you know, help build organic matter slowly um, and soil matter as well. Hey, hey, Ramondo, how much would you recommend? Like, do you have a like a recommended rate of how much compost to put down? Uh, just as a general recommendation. <sighs> I mean, it depends on it depends on you know a lot. It depends on a yeah. lot. But um, it, where okay. you are in the garden depends on like if this your first year doing it or your if you're doing it or your tenth year doing it, it depends on like what that soil test said. It depends on you know. Okay. Like, I mean, I usually, I guess that's totally fair, and that's what you're right on. I agree with you. I usually, as a general rule, say a five gallon bucket for a four by eight raised bed. Just like that, just mm -hmm. gives the people like a starting point, a ref point of reference. But factoring in all, all that you said, I think is important for sure. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean that's is that's what's gonna determine how much you need when when you, when you, how much you gotta put down, all that stuff kind of matters. So um, here I wanted to just touch on um, hot versus cold crop, Michigan first and last frost date, um, which y'all know is fluctuating. Um, <laughs> so uh, we generally, as a rule of thumb, use May tenth, twelfth. 15th ish as the last frost date um you know but you really just got to watch the weather here in michigan honestly you got to make that app 
that weather channel, that news, that weatherman, that person that's going to be helping guide you, you got to know what they're talking about throughout the whole growing season, spring, summer, fall. You got to know, pay attention to all the elements, pay attention to the uh, wind, how much rain come in, all of that kind of stuff. And, and the temperatures, of course, right? And so um, here in Michigan, you know, our zones, our zones range. Look at that, look at that <laughs> range of zones right here in our state alone. It's incredible. We got 6A, we got 5B, we got 5A, we got 4B, we got 4A, we got 3B. That's crazy. Even I see a 3A in there. We got all the zones, literally. <laughs> That's crazy. So just, you know, keep that in perspective where you are. Um, and then we also got those micro zones, right, where, you know, you stay on the east side and it's raining on the east side, but it's not on the west side, all that kind of stuff, you know. So just kind of get familiar with your with your area and um and and pay attention to the weather. But these are just general rule of thumb dates on when to expect expect the frost to leave and to come back again. Um and this is a basic gardening slide, just going to continue on with the hot crop or cold crop. And we're going to talk about uh, transitioning into more plant spacing, um, seeds versus transplants, what the difference is with those, and how to um, go about um, uh, producing with either. So um, there are some plants that prefer to be seeded. There are some plants that prefer to be planted as transplants. Um, I always say try it. If you are interested in trying to direct seed something, try it, see if it works out um, and, and, and go for it. But um, seeds just require a lot more care and maintenance than a transplant would, which is why um, for most folks just prefer to directly transplant the, the seed. So, um, um, and then we're going to touch on plant spacing and uh, seed death as well. So uh, any more, any questions before we transition into the hot crop versus the uh, cold crop in terms of this? Uh, let me check. Uh, nothing, nothing has no. been answered. Okay. Wait, wait. Okay. There is, oh, actually, um, we have a, oh, those are, hey, Kito. Yeah, go ahead. I think you got it. Oh, no, I was going to say we had a question about, um, Wondering how to keep unwanted animals out of the garden while applying compost, mm. if applying compost. <laughs> so I think that they're talking about unfinished compost. Oh, ooh, that's tough. I would, I would probably say the only way you could really ensure that that is like fencing it in or putting like that deer preventative. Uh, type of situation on there where it's like no, I, I think they're saying like they didn't they didn't put it in a pile and decompose it first so there's there's the compost pile where you're putting stuff and it decomposes you're not going to put you know banana peels and coffee grounds right in your garden right right right, right. that's where you're, that's the only reason the I mean rodents and things are we're going to be talking about pest management a little bit later and we have a whole class on that later in the season but yeah yeah but, um, um, but, there, but there is a question does um so re regarding the last frost date coming back to that one yeah um so the question is does that mean after the last frost date is when we can begin planting seeds it depends on the seed it uh really depends i'm gonna touch on that a little bit later on like which ones are frost hardy which ones aren't right um, so that's reading the package right yeah Yep, yep. So we'll touch on that. We'll touch on which ones are frost hardy, which ones aren't. Um, normally, before, if you want to start planting before the frost date, um, you want to generally see because, you know, the plant, the transplant won't be hardy enough to withstand the frost. So um, most people just see directly and um, we'll talk about which ones can tolerate frost later. Um, <coughs> Uh, circling back on this, so um, 
the direct seeding versus transplanting. Um, so some plants don't transplant, you know, very well at all. So uh, like root veggies, like carrots and beets and like radishes, things like that. Those go directly in the ground. Peas, like you see in this picture, these are pea seeds here. Peas don't really enjoy being transplanted. They perform best when direct seeded. Um, and that's just, some plants prefer to be transplanted and do best. Here's a strip tray of tomatoes or peppers here. And um, most people also transplant brassicas as well. So that's your collard greens, broccoli, kale, those sorts of things are usually come in transplant form um, just so they're a bit hardier um, and, and easier to deal with. Uh, and then, so before you start seeding, um, always consider how much time, energy, effort, and capacity you have to uh, maintenance these crops because they will need maintenance as they continue to grow. We're gonna touch on um, maintenancing a little bit later and thinning a little bit later. Um, but I also uh, just wanted to let folks know that uh, seed death is important and, and seed spacing. So it's important for you to read your seed packet. I'm gonna get into that a little bit later too, but it has tons of information and um, make. I just wanna make sure you be able to understand what that means. So seed death is how deep the seed is um, in the ground. And then uh, seed spacing, it's how many uh, inches are so are in between each seed. And then the uh, row spacing is how much space is in between your rows. So all of those things are listed on your packet and they all mean different things. So I wanna make sure that you all understand that. Um, so here we've got a, a quick just presentation on um, a few uh, different uh, maintenance um, techniques and strategies that we are be, um, I'm actually gonna do a visual on the next slide on a few of these, on all of these actually. Um, so in this visual though, you can see that this person plant seeded heavily here like, you know, somebody like, I'm, I'm not waiting to that frost day. I'm ready to get up out of here. So we're going to see some stuff. We're going to see heavy, going to, you know, watch it come up. And then we got to thin it out once it starts to get crowded in here. So, so that's what thinning is essentially is, um, you know, once things get crowded, you got to make room for it to grow. Otherwise, they'll just begin to smother themselves out and kill each other off anyway. Um, and this is a um, beautiful picture out of Brightmore Community Garden where they just look like they uh, staked their tomatoes and peppers up. And we're gonna go over uh, staking, which is these little wooden strips here, their tomato steaks um, are steaks. You can really use them for tomatoes, peppers, really anything, eggplant, anything heavy that has weight. Um, and that's what this slide kind of touches on. So. This is just a visual representation of uh, thinning in real time. Um, so this person seeded uh, directly carrot seeds, which carrots are uh, frost tolerant. You can see carrots right now, no problem. And um, pretty much now throughout the rest of the year, if you like carrots and want to grow them, you're good to go. Um, pretty much as soon as the soil is workable. Thing about carrots is they're very bougie, real finicky. They don't like sticks. They don't like rocks. They'll they'll be curving around. They'll they'll. You call them bougie. <laughs> they are bougie. They bougie, man. So you, they you gotta really like make sure that they in some comfortable, nice, fluffy, soft soil because they're gonna they're gonna tell you about yourself if you don't if not. And then, um, so. The, back to thinning. So as you can see, when they originally thin or seeded these, it was kind of heavy, you know, and then they made more room for them to grow here. This might get you a baby sized carrot. And then you may have to go through again and take one of these baby carrots out just to, so you can get a full carrot after you're growing. So 
that's kind of something that you want to um, keep in mind if you're growing something that will need it to be thin, like um, radishes or carrots, beets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then weeding um, is just removing your unwanted plants from your garden or growing area or walkway. Um, different forms of weeding, but essentially just taking out all the plants that you don't want and leaving what you want as weeding. And then trellising um, is a netting that is used to support climbing plants as they grow and produce fruit and the fruit gets heavy. And the plants, if you don't trellis them, they'll just lay on the ground and the fruits will just be laying on the ground, growing on the ground. So to kind of make support for the plant to, this is really what you want right here. You want that cucumber to be easily harvestable, right, accessible. I could just walk up, snip, and I'm good to go. You want to keep doing that. And then uh, as I touched on earlier, um, staking is when you kind of use some wood and plaques to support your uh, heavier growing crops like tomatoes or eggplants or um, sometimes peppers, or, um, you know, just have just, just heavier, heavier things. Um, as I touched on this earlier too, this is the back of a seed packet. Read it thoroughly from front to back. Read it thoroughly. It's going to inform you on a lot of different things. When to start inside, beets, not recommended. <laughs> Do not start your beet seeds inside. They like to be sown outside. Recommended two to four weeks before average last frost. So we, May 10th, we right in that zone. Beets, good to go. And you can keep seeding beets all year if you like beets, you like beet juice, it's time to get cranking. And um, they usually take 65 days. And this is from seed. I do believe this is from seed um, beets. And But the thing, the tip too about this is uh, some of these days do not include the seed to transplant date the dates are from transplanting to the day of harvest is what they're telling you. So make sure you read your seed packets and it's informative. Um, this slide is just our plan your garden um, family. Um, if you're new to the membership and um, you want to get a head start on picking out what you want, this is the document you need to check out um, this year in the program, we got a lot of choices. So people will have to choose what they get in their program package, okay? And how this is gonna work at Distro, right? Cause I'm like, how does it work? What you mean? So you're gonna have transplant givens, which are what you everybody gets automatically. You're gonna have seed givens, which everyone's get automatically. Then from there, you're gonna have to choose what you want in your bundle so this says choose one so you're going to choose one of these three you're going to choose celery cauliflower or brussels sprouts this is choose two you're going to choose two of these three items <gasps> dino can kale i'm oh, sorry you could choose cabbage or dino kale or two dino kales or two bok choy or one cabbage one bok choy however you want to do it Y'all can choose whatever y'all want. And I'm hoping that y'all like this version better than us picking out what we want to give y'all so we can really get some feedback on what people want to grow. Um, same with the seed situation. So gonna get a given couple seeds. Then from there, you gotta go down the line, choose two of these three type of seeds. You could choose any two you want. Same with this, same with this, same with this. Some have more options than others, but it's the same concept as you keep going down. You're gonna choose two, choose two, choose two, choose two. Okay, but all of these options should be available to y'all. As long as we got them, they'll be there. Um, this is our reference guide for when the plant. Um, Before you go, here's a question. Okay, go ahead. Now you got it? Yes. It says, I've been unclear how to submit the choices from the distri distribution list. Is there mm -hmm. an online form to fill out? No, do we you do it at distribution. Email? No, you just do it at distribution. The seeds will be available for you as you come to the 
distribution. Uh, you don't have to register. You just come um, on the dates. The dates are uh, on the members only page. And I've also been sending out emails for uh, that are have the subject title 2023 uh, distro, distro details. So um, if you're looking for details about the distro, check your email. Um, if you haven't got one, you will within the next couple of days. Um, and it'll have all the details for um, and links to the document that I just showed you, this one with all the seeds. And um, you might want to go through and, and, and go ahead and pick them now before you get to the distro. And, um, so you'll know. Um, okay. Does that answer your question, Nazra? Yes. Okay. We have another question about using seeds from the previous year. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to do? It is. Um, using seeds from the previous year is okay. Um, the thing about seed um, viability is each year you keep the seed, the germination rate viability decreases. So the first year that you get the seed, it may be a 99% germination rate or every you know everyone's going to germinate then you know the next year let's say you got the seeds in in 21 right 22 you go back again you use the same seeds it might be an 80 percent germination rate that's not bad then you come back again 23 it may be 60 or you know whatever so to, is it okay to use them yes um you know is it best to use them it's best to use whatever you got access to. Um, you know, plants do have a life cycle and seeds do uh, lose their viability as they are stored. So just something to know. If you get into that fourth, fifth year, you may experience like some immunity issues depending on storage. It's just, it really depends on a lot, you know. So uh, I hope that helps. Um, so, uh, any more questions before I get to the reference guide? Yes, I have a question. What's up? Your plants, when we get your transplants, the root systems are so good. They go to the outer edges. They're really thick and strong. I've, mm -hmm. I'm growing some seeds like some cucumbers, some flowers from last year's seeds. I'm growing them now. But what suggestions do you have? I mean, I did, I did it last year and my seeds and marigolds turned out beautiful. What okay. suggestions do you have to make that root system real strong like yours? How do you do that? What's your secret? I uh, can't tell you the secret. And I don't grow the transplants. That's not my job. I can't even take accountability for that. That's my coworker, Kello. He does, he's great at his job at um, planning, planning when to see and when uh, the root mass will be optimal for distribution. He's really good at those calculations. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, but in my experience growing transplants, um, you want to uh, treat them, uh, you want to cater to them, but not not enable them, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, well, I have to say your seeds are great because last year I had some great cucumbers and watermelon, Cherise melon, okay. Cena's and Miracles. They were so beautiful from your seeds and yes, I'm doing yes. the same thing here. So thank you so much. and. I'll keep working at it because the seeds, even though my root system are, are not as great as yours, the plants are mm -hmm. always beautiful. And How often are you watering? I have actually been spray watering. When I when I plant, plant the seeds originally, I spray them to keep the topsoil mm -hmm. mo moist. And then when they begin to grow, I have been watering daily. Mm. Okay, let me give you this tip. Let me give you this tip real quick. Okay, so you're using a pump sprayer? Yes. Okay, and I can adjust so, the flow of the water. Okay, so your transplants are growing in their four pack, six pack, or whatever, right? When you're yeah, so watering um, with the, when you're I watering put them in different containers, like for example, some of the zenas are going to grow really tall. I'm going to mm -hmm. share with people. So they have their individual pots already, mm -hmm. and I what I did is I grew them, you know, the seeds, and then I. I um, put them in individual pots so they could get really strong roots and grow tall. I'm doing something a little different this year. And I want those okay. roots to be really strong. So when I share them with others, you know, they're strong plants. 
Yeah, no, so you got it. Yeah, I think you got it. I think you got it. Um, you maybe could water um if you have a hose or a spigot, uh, a little bit. Um, give them, give them more water. So, so the roots will only go as far as the water is. If that makes sense. So if you're okay. using a pump sprayer and your water isn't going all the way down to the bottom of the pot or through all of the soil, the roots are only going to go as deep as that water availability is, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what I did differently, I separate, I'm doing sort of like an experiment. I separated some of them and they all have the saucers on the bottom of the pot. So I start watering them from the bottom and I bought some fertilizer that were for flowers and put them at the stage, you know, that were proceedings to produce more. And I put it like where mm -hmm. it would reach for it in the saucer. And then I sprayed the top still and kept it moist and keep it moist. Beautiful. Yeah, I think so you got I'll it. I'll let you know how it turns out. You know, I'll probably show you, Ramondo. Yeah, let me know. I'll see you at Distro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, no problem. All right, so um, moving forward, if we have no more questions, I'm going to dive into um, cold weather seeds, like we were saying earlier, um, when the plant what, just a little bit more thorough on uh, what is frost tolerant and what isn't. So pretty much all of these root crops are frost tolerant, like we discussed earlier, carrots, beets, we've seen our turnips, radish are good to go. Shallow turnips are good to go. And then these crops are not frost tolerant, but like cool weather, like 35 for like, like, like frost kissing the frost, not, but not right at it. You kind of good to go with these kind of like where we are now, you could be seeding these if you want it, but I wouldn't put these transplants out just yet. I would maybe start to think about hardening them off though. Same with these herbs here. And um, like we discussed earlier, the snaps and shelling peas should be direct seeded if you plan to grow those, okay? Um, leafy greens, like I touched on earlier, um, depends I have a on- question. Yep, yep, what's up? Um, you went kind of fast. Can you slide back to the last slide? Mm-hmm. So for the herbs, should those be started indoors or out, outside? You can start them indoors if you want, but I wouldn't plant them outside until uh, the frost has passed. Um, or like I said, you can start to harden them off, which what that means is uh, exposing them to outside temperatures and elements okay. for okay. a limited amount of time and then bring them back in and then do it again for a longer period of time and then bring them back in until they're acclimated to just stay out. I have another question because those three herbs I'm literally trying to grow right now. All right, let's talk about starter it. kit, but mm -hmm. I have it on the heat and mat. It's been mm -hmm. about seven days, if not over seven days, mm -hmm. and they haven't sprouted. Should I take it off the heat and mat because it it's a no. cold weather seed? No. Okay. No, don't don't don't. You're gonna shock the seed if you do that. So don't do that. Just let it sprout and then. Um, if you want to continue to grow it on a heating mat, you could even do that and then let the temperature catch up to where your plant is at and then start hardening it off. Okay. That make, that make sense to you? Um, pretty much <laughs> leave it on the heating mat. Leave it on the heating mat until the temperature is around about where you got the plant at now and then start the temperature hardening outside? It. Exactly. Got you. Yeah, I got, I know what you mean. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, leafy greens that can be grown for um, the baby salad mix or the mature leaf uh, depends on your preference. Um, if you're growing for a baby salad mix kind of situation. Um, you want to plant a lot denser than you would for a mature uh, leaf, leafy green. So um, most of all of these leafy greens got a pretty turn quick turnaround in terms of harvest. All taste great. Uh, they all got that cut and regenerative harvest type of going on thing where you could just keep harvesting every couple of weeks or so. Um, but if you do plan on like 
uh, harvesting for mature leaves, you want to obviously plant your seeds uh, further apart for the bigger leaves. And then um, for your lettuces, if you want a whole head, you know, you got to uh, sometimes even with the whole heads, you can, uh, there might be a few loose leaves you could just pull off, but for the most part, you want to harvest that whole head at one time. And then for the um, salad mixers, you know, they got that regenerative harvesting going on. Um, and you can just harvest it until you don't like the taste of it, basically. Um, and then Swiss chard and spinach and lettuce really don't have too many pest um, issues to worry about. Um, all the greens, arugula, mustard, turnip are uh, attractions to flea beetles and aphids. And we will discuss those later in the pest slides, okay? Um, GRP cold weather seeds. Um, this is just extended to root crops. We talked about these. You can uh, grow these lower, they go lower to the ground. Um, so they could be subject to shading. So you wanna make sure that your spacing is adequate. Don't shade out, you know, don't, if you plant beets, don't put nothing tall you know, near them or you'll shade them out. Um, and then they're generally seeded densely and then thinned, like we discussed earlier with the carrots. Um, and this will help you, you know, get adequate spacing in, um, in your garden. And they do not compete well with weeds because their leaves are very low to the ground. And then you see it say, especially carrots. I'm telling you, them carrots, they are very bougie. So make sure if you plant carrots that you <laughs> go through your soil and make sure it's good. Um, and carrots take a long time to germinate. Not really long, two weeks. That's not bad. Eggplants take a long time, like four four or six weeks, I think, some of them, so. Um, and then you can use a piece of, um, and the alliums take a long time to germinate too. But you can use a piece of wood to cover the seed bed and try to keep the moisture in until the, the germination is happening. Um, and then uh, you can also use other things like row cover to kind of uh, not hold in the moisture, but protect it. Uh, from any birds or deterred from anything that may want to um, try to come eat your seeds. Um, and then, you know, most of these are one-time harvest type of situation where once you pull it out the ground, that's it. Um, and then this is succession planning note here. And that uh, is just an example of when uh, you plant 20 seeds, 20 radishes in one week. And then again, two weeks later, you stagger your harvest and plant another. 20 or 40, and then you do it again in another two weeks. So now, you know, a month later, you got 20 radishes coming in, then you got 40 radishes coming in two weeks after that, then you got another 40 coming in uh, two weeks after that. So that's where folks start growing for production style. Um, and then we got the GRP code, whether seeds continue. These are the um, herbs that we were just discussing. Um, so chamomile is also kind of finicky. It's not as bad as carrots, but uh, they grow in a, they grow nicely in patches, and then they can be kind of uh, thinned out, if you will. And they they don't they're very small, so you don't got to cover them really deep. Um, and then the chamomile, you you know harvest the head, and um, the flowers continue to produce. Um, most of the time they harvest it and dry it, uh, and make tea or whatever, whatever you want to make out of it. Um, it's the deal, uh, the harvest, the leaves and the flowers, the, for dry or fresh use, um, deal is very invasive. If you didn't know, if you had deal before, you probably don't have it again. Uh, it's not very invasive, but it, it, it shows up. <laughs> it shows up again, again and again. The seeds are very small, so, um, you know, if you have dill in the garden, you'll probably have it for a while. Um, but do not remove more than a third of uh, the plant at a time, um, or, or you, you know, it's subject to go into shock. Um, and then cilantro, one seed every two inches, about uh, a half inch deep. 
um, and then harvest and leave. And once the plants get about four to six inches tall, plants will go to sea or bolt in hot weather. So that's why they prefer cold, colder weather. These are colder weather herbs. Um, there are some cilantro weather uh, varieties that are kind of a little bit more tolerant to heat, but they don't generally like it. So um, harvest all of the plant or remove it before the heat summer sets in. Then we got those two peas we talked about. We sow those every two or three inches, about an inch deep. And then the vines will grow about two and a half feet and they can be grown. Um, most of the time you see them with supporting or trellising, but they can be grown without, depending on the variety of pea. Um, so make sure you read up on your seed packets. And then for the snap peas, you can entire, you can eat the entire pot or, um, and you usually want to wait until the pods are um, you know, size before you harvest them. And then the shelling peas are harvested for the um, peas and not the pods. And then peas also really don't have any pest problems either, honestly. Um, so they're pretty good to grow in that aspect. And then the, moving on to the cold weather transplants now, those can be started indoors to get a jump on the growing season. Honestly, a lot of folks are starting seeds now and they're going through the hardening off process just like we just discussed, all right? And then these are all the fam Brasca family plants that we just talked about. Um, I got a few of these growing. Last year I did broccoli. I think I did over like 80 heads of uh, broccoli. Um, and uh, it was my first year growing it in production like that. It was pretty fun. Um, but all of these, all of these are pretty good to go right now. And then, um, you know, they got the other stuff here, lettuce, leeks, celery. You can also start those. And leeks in particular take a very long time to germinate. So you might want to start those if you plan on growing them this year. Um, just more on the brassicas. Um, they're all biennial, which means they seed in the second year that they grow. Plants have a life cycle. So biennial is when you, they plant seed in the second season of their life. Um, and then most growths would be about 18, 24 inches tall, probably take about a square foot and a half of growing space on, on average. Some could be bigger, some could be smaller. Um, and then broccoli, cabbage, kale, bok choy, they can all be planted again because they're cold weather crops. So in Michigan, you know, we got the spring and we got the fall right back. So you, if you're starting to grasp the concept of when to plant them, you can really get two harvests if you try. And then um, they could tolerate a little frost, um, but you know, like I said, they really like floating around that right at right before frost, between like 45, 35 type of situation. That's when they really thrive. Um, we have a question here about the vegetables, uh, which uh, will grow in sun or in shade. I guess is that like an either or question or that what you're um, asking, Betty? Mm -hmm. So some plants prefer shadier areas and some some plants just prefer sunnier areas uh, or cooler areas um, or warmer areas, so to speak. So the shade is just a cooler area. Um, all plants need some light to photosynthesize, so at least like two to four hours. But I mean, some plants thrive in, in shady areas and some thrive in, in warmer areas. You, it really just depends on the- But for, but for vegetables though, Armando. Yeah, for vegetables- Mostly- they are, right? Yeah, for the most part, they do all mostly need full sun. Um, but you know, they're, it's just, it just really depends, but for, for like, you know, 80, 90% of all of our vegetable production, you know, they need, you know, six or more hours of sunlight to really produce enough energy to give us something to work with in terms of eating. Um, so, um, but, you know, you just gotta, gotta check, uh, you know, on, on your crops and, and 
and make your adjustments as needed. But uh, for the most part, you know, you're going to be planting them in, in an area that has pretty good sun. And and things do happen when you like plant in shady areas. They the plants tend to stretch. If you've ever seen like elongated leaves, um, mm. get really like leggy and thin. And that's an indication that the plants need more more light. And um, so, so this there's is a, there's a few other ones here. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another one is: Do you do you recommend growing the cold weather crops from seed indoor now or transplanting them later? It doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference, and it's whichever one you got time for. Um, you're going to have to tend to them either way, but the seeds take more attention if you seed them directly. Um, if you go try to start the seeds indoors, the, the, you know, the seeds will take a couple of weeks to germinate, so you'll be having to tend to them directly, um, you know, for a couple of weeks, and then as the leaf, you know, the foliage begins to grow, you can kind of like gauge on... Um, you know, where they're at and their health and kind of, you know, uh, let them sit outside. Like like for now, if you, for example, if somebody had plants and they were established enough, they could sit them, they could have sat them outside today, got all that rain and then brought them back in and, you know, yeah. let them, let them uh, you know, dry out and keep growing wherever their spot is, you know? Um, so yeah, you can you can do either one. It just depends. Like, and then on the other end of that, right? If you go try to see your whole garden, you're gonna have to water your whole garden, which right now isn't a problem because it's raining, right? Like that's what that's what I did. I see there's a whole lot of stuff this year, and it's been raining all week, so I don't really gotta worry about it right now. The thing is, when it stops raining. I'm gonna have to keep up with all the things that have now germinated, you know? So it depends really on what you have capacity to do and, um, you know, what, you, what you're trying to do, honestly. Okay. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> okay, Keto just answered that one. Okay. We have one about... And the F, the amphids, the bugs, the aphids. We gonna we gonna get we gonna get to that one. I'm about okay. to uh, run into that one actually in a few more slides. Okay. Okay. Yep, that was it, Dan. Well, okay, and then these um, these slides, these next couple slides, honestly, y'all, uh, is just um, a lot of us uh, telling you all what is on the back of those seed packs how much plant spacing you need. The broccoli needs 12 to 18 inches. This is how to harvest it. All of this stuff is typically on your seed packs. It's gonna tell you how to harvest it. It's gonna give you all kind of notes on how to make it grow better. So make sure you read, 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 read those seed packs, y'all, because they're gonna tell you a lot of information on what you're growing. Um, even the ones we give you, uh, the seeds we give you, they have a lot of notes in those little seed pamphlets. So make sure you read them. Um, same thing with this. And like Keto said, we'll share these uh, presentation and the uh, Zoom with you all. So you'll have a, a look at all of these things, but we just going through telling you how much spacing things need, how to harvest them and which parts are edible um and yeah you know brussels sprouts you don't want the leaves we want the leaf the the nut the buds that grow so collars we eat the leaf kale we eat the leaf bok choy we eat the leaf or the hell head if you want to harvest it as a head and then just going over some more plant spacing and then here are the aphids um so dealing with aphids um Aphids are the, the small white uh, or gray looking bugs you see. Uh, these are soft body insects, which means that they uh, can be killed if you smish them together kind of, kind of situation. But we suggest usually 
that you spray uh, the aphids off your plants with a blast of water from a water hose, or if you got a strong enough pump sprayer to get them off, you can use that, or you can use the detergent soapy water situation, or you can use um, all types of stuff. So just, you know, check it out. And then the cabbage loopers are uh, these, these guys right here who actually morph um, into these once they uh, mature. So these little white, everybody think they're butterflies. These are not butterflies. <laughs> they are green. These are killing your, this is what's killing your greens. It's laying knees, it's laying knees on here. And this guy is munching. They, they camouflage so well on the greens. You can't mm -hmm. see them. You really got to pay attention. They usually under the under, underside, but sometimes I've seen them like on top of the leaf, like right on his main stem, just chilling. I mean, it really just depends. So, um, but eventually they, they get big enough. They uh, morph into these and then they begin the life cycle. And these usually uh, live uh, around uh, majority of the season, honestly. Um, and they treat them by removing them either by hand or with a stick, but you got to take them off the plant. I usually have on gloves and I just take them off with my hands and, and smash them in between my fingers. I had a lot of success using tool, putting that netting over because I uh, have a potato garden. Yeah, mm -hmm. I put, covered all my pots with the netting and mm -hmm. that kept that white... Uh, Butterfly, whatever you want to call it, uh, off mm -hmm. the plant. Yep, netting that that rope cover helps. Yeah, the edge to it kept them off. Yep, yep, it kept it'll deter it'll deter them a lot, and that's really that's all you want. When they flying around, they just trying to find something to, to lay on or eat real quick. Mm -hmm. So that little netting, they'll be like, "Up, oh, I ain't dealing with that," and just gone to somebody else's garden who don't got no netting and mm -hmm. smash them, you know. And so that's really all you want to do. You just want to deter them, you know, um, from from entering your space. Uh, and then I wanted to get on the flea beetles real quick. Before you move on. Oh, go ahead. There's a, a question about, do you have anything to, or any suggestions for treating the soil before planting, treating it for the um, aphids? Mm, you can put some diatone down. Um, but other than that, that, that would really be it. I mean, the aphids, uh, they're gonna, and then, uh, oh man, the aphids, they, they can be bad, but I mean, it's just best to keep checking on them and don't let them get, you know, comfortable on the plant. Um, but aside from that, no, I don't know if you got any keto. Um, <laughs> And forgive me if you mentioned this because I've been paying attention to answering some questions in the chat, but I always say that like the first line of defense with any of these pests is making sure that the Romano has been talking about all these things that the plants need to be healthy, right? So we're always making sure that the plant, that like the first line of defense is a healthy plant, which is has enough sunlight, has enough water, um, has enough nutrients. After that for aphids, um, I'm not sure if there's anything putting in the soil that's going to really make an impact. Um, it's just like either doing the blast of water or, you know, inspecting your plants and trying to get them because you're going to have aphids. You're going to have, you will at some point in your gardening career have aphids. And so, <laughs> um, so just try and get them, you know, catch them early and then you can knock the population back and then really. I've heard, heard about them doing a what you call a sacrificial plant oh yeah bait 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 planting that's what they call it or trap yeah. crop or something like right. that right. with so different they, type of names for it but what essentially what that is is you grow something uh so in in just in terms of like the aphid flea beetle right so they like leafy greens so you would grow a patch of leafy greens as a sacrifice like okay they can have that just so they don't touch like your quarter acre of the real deal greens that you want to grow. The problem with that is it can become an infestation, the bait, the bait situation. Mm -hmm. right? 
And then that's all it takes is that one good gust of wind to blow those insects into your good area. And you got a colony, you got a colony of of insects Mm -hmm. now trying, you're trying to fight. So, I mean, you know, people, some people do use that. I feel like people use that um, in, in larger scales um and and um or like if you only have a few plants um in a in a specific area then you may want to try to leave one out for something to, something to get that instead of what you what you actually growing but um just pros and cons you can you can try it you know it's pros and cons to it um and what then about- oh, oh go ahead go ahead go ahead no. I wanted to know. I heard about putting down diatomaceous earth. Have you ever did that before? Yeah, that's what I that's what I was referencing when I said diatome. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's what it is. It's just that's the type of rock it is. But um, the dust is called diatomaceous earth, and they make it a um, you know, garden safe. But when you're applying it, make sure you cover your you know, wear a mask or something so you don't breathe it in. Um. And then, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll, uh, it will, uh, it will, uh, you know, try to defend all of those uh, soft body insects that we were talking about earlier. Pretty sure it affects all of these, the aphid, the cabbage looper. And if the diatomaceous earth is on there, then the looper, the, the uh, adult looper won't lay the eggs because, you know, they'll die, right? So, um just another another point, but the thing with that is like, it's gonna rain. You're gonna have to redo it. It's just like it's work re- regardless. But it does. There there are things that you can use, right? And there are tools that you can use, so you can use them accordingly. Um, this is Toronto, just, could yeah. you talk about? Uh, we've been people have been talking about using tool or like you know something to cover the plants. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. not sure if you mentioned the row cover yet, but could you yeah, talk, we'll talk about, about it? it. So row okay. cover Can is make a, sure um, that folks know how to access it too, please. Yeah, yeah. Row cover is um, a, a white cloth. We were discussing it earlier. You most of the time people lay it on their plants, or our growing space, raised beds, or even your pots. Um, you lay as soon as you plant, and then it what it does is it acts as a fabric to deter these pests from you know laying or trying to gather on your spaces. Um, but you do want to check under your row cover every here and there to make sure nothing's gotten under there. I've seen people use row cover. They pull it back and they see this because they didn't check it. You just thought the row cover was there working and really he was making a home. So you got to manage your space regardless. Okay. There's no way around it. You got to go check it out. Um, and you know, make, make sure that the tools that you have are working. So how you access the row cover from us is we usually distribute it at the um, distributions where you get your plants and seeds. Um, if we have both uh, row cover and trellis netting available, we'll ask folks which option they want. And um, and then, you know, once one runs out, we just give away the rest of the other one until we don't have any more at the distributions. But um we usually try to pass out around a thousand units um, combined of them both. So um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to um, get those gone. And as we see a need uh, growing for them, we'll continue to just buy more um, supplies and distribute them. Uh, hope that helps. Um, and then uh, this slide here is just uh, referring to more about lettuce plant spacing, how to harvest, um, same type of deal, hot courages and uh, hot weather encourages bolting. Um, avoid harvesting early in the morning because the lettuce tastes really bitter once it's full of chlorophyll, which is essentially like plant sugar, plant blood sugar, however you want to how you ever want to say it, but um, it's really nasty to us, it's really bitter. And so the more photosynthesis that the lettuce has done throughout the day, the more chlorophyll it's built up, the bitter it'll be. So try to harvest it in the morning if you can. Um, and then uh, hot, these are, we're gonna just jump into hot weather seeds now, um, kind of the same deal. 
uh, the hot weather seeds can be planted after last frost, May, May as we discussed earlier, um, and they do not tolerate any frost-like, frost-esque temperatures. Um, you gotta just keep keep going um, right after the frost is gone. You wanna wait until you don't see any, any frost in mind, and then the temperature should be, you know, 65 or better. And the low should be like 50, 55 or better to, to even, you know, put, put these outside. And so uh, these are cold, hot weather seeds, the bush beans, these, these crops specifically prefer to be seeded. Okra is one of those. Some people do transplants of okra. I've seen that. Um, concurbents, butternut squash, Delicata squash, rubber squash, zucchini, cantaloupe, all of these like to be direct seeded, but I have seen folks do plants of these as well. And if you are planning on doing plants, you have to make sure you put the seeds in big enough um, pack, seed packs. So usually these are in like three packs or double packs. Um, these you may be able to get away in four packs because they're a little bit smaller. Um, these you may be able to do four packs or maybe even double packs for some of these um, bigger flowers. So, and then greens, we've got callaloo. That's a smaller seed, so you can, you know, treat it as a, a collard green or, or so, if you will. Um, then we're going to go into the hot crop seeds in more depth here. I'm just telling you about that plant, that seed spacing. So seeds are four to six inches apart and 18 inches apart in their row. So remember our seed spacing is how many inches are in between the seeds and our row spacing is how many inches are in between our rows of seeds. So we've got to make sure that we pay attention to that and reading it. And then we're just going to go through that um, same type of situation for all of our hot crop seeds here. Um, just little tips. You might want to install trellising if you are planning to grow pole beans. You might want to do that at the time of planting and not wait till the beans are ready, you know, mature and get to getting too big. Um, and then these are the dates of harvest for black eyed peas and snap beans and dry beans here. And then your pick pole beans uh, you need to pick them as often as possible. Otherwise, it'll really slow down the production of the plant. And um, it's best to get them when the pods are really small. So, uh, you know, you get a nice tender pod and not a, a, a rough, tough one. Um, cucumbers, moving on to those. Um, your spacing is very, 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 very important with this crop here. Is very susceptible to powdery mildew, and one of the ways to prevent that is airflow. So, make sure that you provide them with a lot of space. Um, the seeds should be uh, mounded about 18 inches apart, and um, you could, they say, put two seeds in each one. You can thin, maybe if you want. You might be able to say, you know, save it later. And the vines will really get aggressive if you don't trellis them or give them anything. They'll just start climbing over whatever other plants you got around them. So make sure you give them something to climb on. They like a lot of water, um, one inch of rain or hand watering per week. Continuous is critical for harvesting because they'll continue to just keep absorbing that water and producing um, throughout the whole season. So make sure you continuously water those. Um, and then you want to harvest them before they get too big and they still kind of have these little bumps on them. Once you see these getting uh, smoothed out, the skin is starting to get tougher and the seeds are, this plant is going to start putting more energy in the seed production versus the actual uh, crop production. And we want, we want the crops to taste as good as possible. Um, and then watch out for the cucumber beetle as well. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so this is the cucumber beetle here. It eats the leaves of the cucumbers and really destroys the plant and it grows really quickly. Um, and you know, with these, you can, uh, use that soapy water deal again, 
Um, you could try to use some diatom again, and you could try to uh, just pick them off with your hands or push them in a bucket of water or whatever you whatever you got to get rid of them. Um, and just check on check on your your concurrence every day or every other day to make sure that you know the beetles haven't gotten a hold of them. Um, and then uh, moving on to our hot weather transplants now. These are all the hot weather plants that like to be transplanted in those strip trays or out of those strip trays into a bigger cell, into a four pack or a six pack, and then initially planted into the ground. Um, and they do not tolerate any frost, same as the seeds. Um, and this includes all of your tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and your common herbs, basil, parsley, oregano, squash, and all your yellow squash, watermelon, cucumbers, like we discussed, um, all of that good stuff. You want to get those growing indoors if you can or, um, you know, start your seeds earlier than the anticipated frost date to get them going. Um, so same deal, uh, a lot of detail on uh, plant spacing, row spacing, um, tomato cages. You really need something to support the weight of the of these fruits. We're going to touch on that in a little bit too. Um, and then you want to, for tomatoes, you can bury it if it's really tall and it'll produce more roots. And you also wanna make sure you're suckering the tomatoes. So, and it, that'll promote better production and um, easier management of your harvest. And then the peppers just goes over those plant. Oh, and this this whole family usually has around two feet row spacing or three feet, two or three feet row spacing and about a foot and a half or two feet of plant spacing. So, what you, excuse me, what do you mean by suckering as far as your tomato plants? Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm about to get on that in one second. It's actually, I think on the next slide or two, I'm gonna ha have a um, visual of what suckering is. Okay. Now, and then uh, the peppers, those can be staked. Um, some of them will do well, but the heavier ones as they mature, or even the peppers period as they mature, get heavy and will require some type of support. Um, and they can be picked red or green. They'll ripen off um, once you pick them. The eggplants, they about three feet apart and plant them about 18 and 24 inches apart. Same with the tomatillos, um, ground cherries, same thing with them. Uh, excuse me. And then these crops also have common pest and disease issues um, in terms of the aphid, the potato beetle, which is, uh, you know, like the flea beetle and um, blight, which is a disease of, um, of sorts with the plants. And they also have susceptible to blossom rot as well, which is another one that we didn't talk about there. Um, and this is a tomato hornworm here. Um, you may have, may or may not have seen this in your garden. It kind of eats the tomato plant and destroys the actual fruit. Um, or you may have seen it with the little white wasp eggs coming out of it. Wasp like the later eggs in these. And then uh, this is another picture of aphids. You see they kind of just chilling on this pepper plant. Same deal, we gonna blast them off with a, with a spray of water um and get them out of here because those soft body insects and then uh this is blight it looks like um which is just like a, a disease where the plant gets begins to lose discoloration turns yellow and just begins to crumble up um and now we're going to talk about the concurbent family um, these uh, need a lot of water and a lot of space as well, just like the cucumbers. Um, and uh, watermelons really need a lot of water, like they need watermelons for a reason. Like <laughs> I grew watermelons last year. Um, it was great. Um, I think I got like 60 watermelons out of my bed. Um, it was a... Uh, 
crazy. My vines were crazy long. Um, they do. So I had one row of watermelons and they probably reached over to like the third or fourth row over them from where I planted them. So they really need a lot of space. <laughs> and it's good to mulch them, um, kind of retains the moisture and give the fruit something to kind of sit on and hides it from the squirrels and neighbors. Ha ha, right? <laughs> and then um, you want to watch for your pottery mildew and your cucumber beetles on those crops as well, because they will uh, kind of like the same family, right? If I can't get collard greens, then I'll take care or I'll take, you know, uh, whatever. So, you know, kind of watch out for those same type of bugs. Uh, the spot on the melon, you want to watch out for that. Uh, you want it to be yellow when you harvest and it's going to start off green, it's going to turn to white and then it's going to turn yellow. Okay. Um, the darker the yellow, the more indicative it is that that watermelon is probably ripe. Um, and then you got the tendril, which is like a curly like antenna that the watermelons and other type of concurbents and even peas have tendrils as well, where they grab onto things and climb up them. Um, the watermelon tendril is uh, closest to where the melon is at the main stem. It should be brown or dry when you plan to harvest it, okay? Um, and you can always uh, smack the bottom of the watermelon. I don't know if you've ever seen people do that. Um, you know, uh, I tried it a couple of times, but I'm not good with that method yet, y'all. I just, I just wait for the spots to turn dark and try to harvest it then. But my uncles, they can tap it and know if it's not, if it's ready or not. So, um, and then the summer squash, uh, I plant those eight to 10, 18, 24 inches apart, usually in my rounds. And they require water, a lot of water as well, to especially before they're established. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you want to harvest the squash when they're still small and not too uh, rough in terms of the skin and not too big um, in terms of like uh, the seed, you know, that you want the uh, flesh to be uh, tolerable to eat. You don't want to be super rough like you chew on the couch, right? And then, um, you know, you want to remove any leaves that show any signs of powdery mildew immediately to keep the plants healthy. And your uh, blossom blooms are delicious. Squash blossoms are delicious. And this is a picture of the powdery mildew here. Um, just wanted to reference that if you've never seen it. Uh, and then um, I think that's it. I think that's it, you all. Um, so we can open it up to questions. If you all like, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, you said you were gonna mention the suckering, that term, what that meant? Oh, oh, I didn't even see the, uh, okay, hold on, let me go. Yeah, I didn't mean, I didn't see that. Let me see. We didn't sucker. We didn't talk about sucker. Uh, that's not a good picture. Let me see if I can find a good picture in uh, in my presentation. I, you know what? I, I can find one for you, Ramondo. Why don't you just focus on um, questions and on questions? Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. If I can zoom in. Oh, there you go. Yep. If I can zoom in here. Okay, love. So oh, let me go back. Okay, so. Suckering your tomatoes, okay? When your tomato grows, uh-oh. Your tomato grows, um, it will, you know, start as a transplant, right? As it continue to grow, it will begin to shoot out these leaves, and then it'll begin to shoot out actual fruiting vines, right? Okay. Now, when it does that, you want to start paying attention because now it's going to start shooting out suckers, too. And a sucker is essentially one of the fruiting vines that grows in the middle of the these two, the main stem and the leaf stem. So okay. this would be your sucker. Okay. And this would put maybe be a sucker. You gotta watch it though, because sometimes it'll come off and then do a, a, 
uh, it won't be a sucker. It'll just be a man, uh, a fruit. But most of the time, it's best practice if you think it's a sucker, take it off, okay? And it'll promote more more growth and more um, productivity of the tomatoes in your plant, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, All right. The powder, uh, the the mildew, the powder mildew. Do you just use that detergent, or are you use well, something? Yeah, it's best to it's best to really get ahead of that. Like as soon as you see it, you wanna kind of get rid of it and uh, eliminate any leaves that you see on it. Um, once it gets like infested with powdery mildew, it's really hard to get rid of it, honestly, because it's airborne. So like okay. every time it waters, it's going to just spread and spread and spread. Yeah, because that's what happened with my butternut. It, it started getting it and I was just cutting the leaves off. I didn't know if that was the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, that's really uh, pretty much all you could do. I actually... I do think it's some sprays. Um, neem oil. The neem oil. Make. Yeah, yeah, the neem oil may work, but it it's like you got to get it early because once it's established, it's really hard to get it. Yeah, it 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 takes off. Yeah, <laughs> Thank for you. Sure. And it and it also it just comes with the season. Honestly, um, it's more moisture in the air. It's like really hard to you know to fight it. You know, okay. it usually takes over during the end of the year. You know, the plant's immune system is, low, you know, starting to decline. Da, da, da. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and it was something about the um, the cherry tomatoes or something, the ground tomatoes. You could you want them to you can hang them in pots. Yeah, yeah. If you want to, the ground, the uh, yeah. The, the uh, ch you talking about the little gold ones, the yeah. brown chairs? Yeah, right. you, can, you can do those. And you can I, do those. I didn't put it in a pot. I didn't know that it could be put, placed in a hanging pot. Yeah, they'll they'll droop down. They'll droop down like those hanging plants. They'll grow. Okay. Like okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah Wandrak uh, was saying, uh, "Sorry if I missed this. Could you explain?" Well, I think this is related to the growing melons. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain what you mean by mounds? Uh, mounds are like a pitcher's mound. If you could visual a pitcher's mound, how it's kind of like an elevated lump, if you will, of soil. Um, and you want to elevate that, uh, that seed because that, that, first of all, the seeds are big. So you really want to give them a big comfy space to grow in and germinate in. And then <clears throat> as the plant begins to grow, the leaves are bigger and the vines will begin to stretch out as the plant grows. So you really want to give it a secure spot to stabilize itself. And that's what the mound essentially becomes over time as the roots develop into it, if that makes sense. So how big should the mound be? Should it be like... Not a pitcher's mound big, just yeah. enough for the seed to sit comfortably in. Um, maybe like a couple handfuls of soil, maybe, if that roughly, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like, Pam, did you I see that? Yeah, I see your hand up, Pam. I see you. Sorry. You're all right. I'll see you, Pam. I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had asked a question in the chat about organic sources of your seedlings and seeds and so forth. Um, do we have options or are they organic or? Yeah, our seeds are organic. You don't have to worry about us giving you no bad seeds. Um, you know, uh, they are organic. We do. I know Keto said he was working on a list of folks that have uh, reliable fruit and uh, seed options. Are you still doing that, Keto? Like re like sourcing the uh, pl folks places uh, places folks can get like fruit, fruit and oh oh oh, oh. Per that's perennial fruit. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. 
And I, I mean, a lot of those same places are that. probably That's there, a lot. It's so. kind of a side note, but there are, uh, there, I mean, related to, how does that relate to this question? I'm not sure. Well, the place, those same places that are offering those uh, perennial fruit will likely have organic seeds if she wants to buy them. Oh, well, not necessarily, honestly. Um, if you're looking for organic seeds, I can I can throw a few um, vendors in the chat, but I mean we and then you know I guess full transparency like we, um, I would say most of our seeds. Are, so organic is a label that is. Uh, let's just kind of get that label for a second. Like organic is is kind of become a thing that's it has relations to sort of certification and. Um, we at Keep Running Trait more use organic practices. So we don't use any chemical fertilizers. We don't use any pesticides. We source our seeds from ethical like places that aren't doing or like that aren't like big, um, big corporations that are you know dominating the seed industry and things like that. I would say not 100% of our seed is certified organic um, because we are buying lots and lots and lots of seed um, and it uh, organic seed comes at a price. So if you want to go, if you wanna be in that organic pocket, you gotta pay for it. Um, but in the end, you are growing that seed. So it, it's it's more about like having an ethical source like the, the uh, companies and I'll put a few in the chat as I'm gonna, I said, but like, um, you are going to be making organic by planting it in your garden. I mean, it's like if you were, it would be different if like, you know, you were an organic farm and you were growing acres of food, then there's all this process, you know, to get certified, you pay the, you know, you pay to get a certifier and in the U.S. government, you know, inspects you and all this kind of stuff. Um, but for the home gardener, you know, I think, what we supply is, is a, is, I would say is a, is a of high quality, um, but not necessarily always hundred percent organic. Okay. I got you. Um, just a real quick aside with that, um, yeah. in terms of sources of more naturally based, uh, fertilizers and, uh, weed killers. How do you, are, do you guys have a class or recommendations on, on those kinds of practices to avoid? The chemicals. Um, all of our classes are kind of organically focused, so mm -hmm. yes, yeah. So we and um, you know we talked a little bit tonight about like diatomaceous earth and um, which is organic, you know, related. So we actually have a class coming up in May. I believe it's May twenty fifth, but the information will be up on our website shortly if it's not already. Um, specifically around like digging deeper into pests and uh, like, so Romano like cover a lot of the, the main characters, um, but this class will, is specifically two hours just on um, dealing with pests. Um, so we would, you know, go into detail more with that kind of stuff at that class. Okay. okay. Are eggshells good for feeding plants? <laughs> People are, have told me use yeah, they're a great source of calcium. So it's it's more that you would incorporate those into your compost pile. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Now, have you heard of people using, I guess, sardines in their mm. plants at the you know to fertilize? I definitely heard people burying fish heads before. I don't yeah, know about fish, fish, but yeah. never. Yeah, I heard them using uh, in container gardens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it seems like it's kind of a, like a sardine. You get a little can for three bucks, right? right. So that's a lot of sardines. <laughs> that's a lot of sardines. <laughs> but like if fish guts or fish heads, like you could get from the fish, you know, market, people, yeah. I've heard people definitely talking about that, but okay. definitely bury them. You know, you, you don't want Bear to says, eat that steak. Uh, Sarah says, do we have any classes on composting? Yes, coming up April 25th. Does that, speaking on that, I put a question in there. Um, I wanted to reuse my soil for my container pots from last year and uh, 
about refreshing the soil. Okay. I used a, um, last year I used a, like a, a one third, one third of potting soil, one third um, peat moss. And Did you have any uh, pest moss. issues? Did you have any pest no. issues last year? No. And you should I be used, good to go. Yeah. Okay, so what do I put any more organic matter in the in the pot? I would too? always, yeah. You should put more in there when you plant whatever you plan on our seed, whatever you plan on seeding uh, in the pot, then add, add to it for sure. Okay. And then you even need to maybe like uh, loosen up the soil in that pot as well before you get the okay. going. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 All right, any more questions, y'all? It's eight o'clock. I know y'all are hungry. I have one more question, real quick. What's so, up, sir? Yeah, so I, I moved into this apartment and there's a giant garden bed in the backyard. Um, and I have no idea who lived here before me. So I'm trying to figure out. I had thrown on some nice soil on top of it at the end of the summer last year. But do you think it's safe to just like, mix it all up and then test the soil like i'm sure it's fine but just to make sure that it's um nutritious enough or like the nutrients are good and balanced maybe just get it tested i mean that's the only way you would know you know yeah. or you can always add compost to it <clears throat> you know i'm sure when it was built it probably was filled with pretty good soil i'm assuming yeah um, but just to know for a record, you could always get a soil test, just to know. Okay, and that just would be like a Ziploc bag of like a couple different- um, It's like four cups of soil that we recommend you bring to the uh, to the office if you wanna take your own sample out the bed. And then I would definitely take it from different spots of the bed just to get an overall picture of- Okay, cool, thank you. Soil quality is. No problem. There's, a, there's also a one pager with the instructions if you want more detail. On our I can drop it in the chat right now. Okay, okay. any last questions for Ramondo before we take off for the night? Yeah, I, I never thought about peat moss. So you just kind of like stir the peat moss with the soil? Yep. For containers? Yeah. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> Good to know. Yeah. I just dropped that soil testing guide in the chat for you too, sir, if you want to um, use it. Um, and anybody else too, for that matter. Um, all right, any other questions, y'all? I'll have to go eat dinner myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. See you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Happy Easter. Thanks. Nice meeting you, Naja. I'll see you uh, soon. Yes, yes. Thanks, I appreciate Thank it. All right, good, good night, everybody. All good right, night. peace. Peace.